I'm on. Good evening. My name is Lynn Brown, Executive Director of the John Bradamus Center at NYU. Welcome to all of you, those who are here in person and those joining us virtually. And those of us who are here on campus are actually meeting in the Global Center for Academic and Spiritual Life. Now, any building with these three words in it, global, academic, and spiritual, seems to me the perfect grounding for an exploration of the arts and their role in our lives, personal, intellectual, and spiritual. We have an exciting program for you this evening, and uh, which we'll kick off in a minute. At f but first, just a few formalities and introductions. I'm here in my capacity tonight as, as I said, the head of the Bradhamus Center, which was pleased and honored uh, to shepherd this project over a multi-year journey uh, to the book and the event actually celebrating the book launch tonight. We did this in keeping with the Center's mission to promote the legacy of John Bradhamus, former member of Congress, former president of New York University, for whom education and the arts were pole stars in his legislative life and in his career as president. Let me introduce the architects and stewards of this project uh, who have brought it to fruition with the help of many talented authors, some here, some here, some joining us uh, virtually. Michael Denicia, who is deputy director of the Bradhamus Center and whose own involvement in uh, international intellectual engagement and particularly the role of the arts in combating Islamophobia helped shape this initiative. His, uh, this was for him a labor of love with equal emphasis on labor and love. <laughs> uh, Alberta authors, uh, indomitable, indefatigable, uh, whose curatorial skills actually helped shape the authors of the book and it is a luminous group. Uh, a former college president herself, well known in the foundation world, longtime uh, head of the Director of Arts and Humanities at Rockefeller Foundation. Alberta combines, as I said in the foreword, the compassion of a humanist with the discipline of a drill sergeant. And that's <laughs> what it takes to corral over two dozen authors into this book. So I'm going to introduce the two of them then just be back for one quick minute, and then we'll get on to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, and as Lynn alluded to, this has been a particularly gratifying project to work on because it is one that is so inspired by the work of John Bradamus and the mission he gave to the center. John was known as Mr. Arts on Capitol Hill because of his crafting and supporting of legislation that used the arts to enrich Americans' everyday lives. Uh, John also believed in the power of bringing together thinkers and doers, as he called them. And that is the mission he bequeathed to the center. It informs all of our work, and I think the fruits of such an approach have really been borne out by this project, or the Arts Essential. We began with a conference in the hills of Florence at NYU's campus there, and we're deeply grateful to our colleague, Ellen Toscano, who is executive director of NYU Florence, organized that first conference with us. Uh, the meeting there set the tone for what we did over the next three years, culminating in this book. That meeting was multidisciplinary and multi-practice. We had working artists, professionals from cultural organizations and grant-making foundations, sitting around a table with scholars from history, philosophy, education, public policy, sociology, and the visual and performing arts. By having all of these folks together who don't normally interact in such a way, having them all talk around a table, we generated a genuine learning commons. And we've carried this through multiple conversations in other conferences, in person and online, uh, at a time in our country where it seems harder and harder to talk across divides. We showed the value in doing just that even in a small specific way. That the very act of coming together and sharing knowledge in that process generated a better understanding of the importance of the arts in our everyday lives, uh, much the way, the same way we feel the book does as leading in Aristotle's phrase to a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. 
Uh, we would not have been able to do all this without the help of so many other colleagues. Uh, two in particular I'd like to thank. Uh, Tom McIntyre heads up our public programming and puts together all of our conferences. Uh, his skills showed through in how comfortable and at ease everyone felt in those spaces we created for our conversations. And the other is our colleague, Nessa Rappaport, a consummate professional in editing who put us on a schedule and worked with our authors to clarify their visions and their voices through the editing process. Uh, as I said, we hope this book is the start, not the end of a conversation, uh, including the conversation we're engaging in right here. Uh, and so now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Alberta Arthurs. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Michael. Um, and welcome to all of you who are joining us to talk about art, the arts essential. Uh, are the arts essential is not a rhetorical question. It is a real question a question which was, I believe, the single simple prompt that actually became this book. In each approach to our contributors, this was the question asked and the question considered by the 27 talented, generous, deeply experienced people who became the book. Of course, we all appreciate the arts. We know we want the stimulation, the excitement, the immediacy of a concert or a play, the movement of poetry or dance, the insights of visual art. Art moves us beyond the day and beyond the day by day. We know that. But this book asks a different question. The assumption behind it is that the people who make or manage or mount art seldom are asked, why they do it, what they do it for, what they intend, what motivates them, what they hope for, what they aspire to. I am moved emotionally myself and moved to action as well by the importance of the writings that came back in answer to this non-rhetorical question. In repeated readings of these writings, I have never failed to be moved by what we are told by their writers. Each answer to the title question, each essay, is deep, dramatic, and each is demanding of us as readers and as citizens. As citizens, we are asked by Mary Miss in the book to see the roles that visual arts can play in making the environment and its degradation visible. Jesse Rosen of the League of American Orchestras and Dan Weiss of the Metropolitan Museum ask us to think with them about what major cultural institutions like orchestras and museums can do and must do to confront the issues of our time. Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation asks us how art addresses and activates response to social injustice in our America. This evening, we will hear directly from four of these incredible contributors to Are the Arts Essential. Each of them probes the offerings of the arts, and each of them sounds an alert. The book offers 25 examples of the essentiality of the arts to our lives and times its message is, most simply, take action through the arts. Or better yet, as Anthony Apaya, one of our speakers tonight, phrases it in the book, imagination teaches us how to respond to unimaginary events. We want to give thanks tonight to the many people who have made this book possible, to the contributors, of course, their insights and ideas are the heart of what we've done. And thanks to the team that advanced this work, Ellen Toscano, who mounted the first conversation about it at NYU's home in Florence. Deep thanks to Michael Denisha and Tom McIntyre of NYU's Bradamus Center. They are indispensable. Thanks to the indispensable line editor, Nessa Rappaport. The Bradamus Center has been the harbor for this book, as Lynn has mentioned, 
since its start, providing space and talent, helping to mount the discussions that fed it, helping in every way to make it happen. And the NYU Press, we owe much to the head of the press, Ellen Chodish, who challenged us. Her acumen, her ambitions for us made this a better book. We gained greatly from working with our editor, Eric Zimmer, and the great NYU Press staff and our funders. We owe much to Lane Harwell at the Ford Foundation, Laura Tisch of the Laura Tisch Illumination Fund, and the wonderful Ben Rodriguez Cabanas, who has shared this adventure all the way. Most of all, we owe thanks to Lynn Brown, Senior Vice President at NYU and Director of the Bradhamus Center. Lynn is a champion of ideas and renovation, innovation and enterprise, and of this enterprise. A final observation about life in this book. We are all thinking about Ukraine. We are all thinking about President Zelensky, who fights for his people, for his country, the democracy. He moves us, he moves nations. History is happening. In I, the Arts Essential, Richard Sennett offers an essay that is precisely about this, called Darkness and Light, The Power of Performing. It's about the importance of performance in art and in actuality. Richard cites the play scene in Hamlet in which art reveals reality, and he reminds us of the performances the speeches, the parades, the films that propelled the rise of Hitler. Richard writes about the power of performance for good and for evil in human affairs, in history. President Zelensky is an actor, in fact. He is a narrator of note. He is a storyteller who tells us the story in real time that is his history and ours as well. That telling is the stage we are on with him. We share with each other and with Ukraine history as it happens in the theater of war, in the tragedy of a nation, through the performance of the key actor in it. History and art have heroes and villains. History happens and art reveals. Art is an entry into a home for an explicator of, an instigator of our realities and our histories. Thank you for being here. It's sort of like the Academy Awards. People just keep coming in and out. Um, so I asked to come back because I'm exercising a point of personal privilege, as we used to say in the United States Congress, uh, because I wanted to introduce our moderator, uh, Mary Schmidt Campbell. Uh, Mary and I uh, met each other and worked together during the entirety of her successful tenure as NYU's Dean of the Tisch School of the Arts. A former commissioner of the New York City Office of Cultural Affairs. Give me a thumbs up that everyone's hearing me. All right, good. Uh, an experience which she draws on very much in her essay in the book about the role of the arts in rebirthing New York City during the late 1970s and 1980s. And she's been on every city, state, federal advisory board that anybody can find about arts and humanities to put her on all to the good advantage of those boards. And of course, she decided then to also take up the presidency of Spelman College, uh, where she resides now as the 10th president. So uh, a scholar, an expert as well in the life of Romare Burden uh, with an award-winning book. I can't think of a better person to lead us on this uh, conversation tonight. I've worked at NYU for several decades, um, and two of my favorite deans during that time are here tonight, both of whom are contributors to the book, and that is Mary Schmidt Campbell and Kate Stimson. And it leads me to the final thought, and then I will get out of the way, that yes, the arts are essential, 
and we have found out technology is too, but equally so our gifted colleagues and friends who we can gather together, uh, which I consider, whom I consider all of you. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mary. And one final note and plug for the book, and also thanks for the NYU Press, which did a terrific job, uh, the head of the press, Ellen Chodish, and our editor, Eric Zinn. Thank you very much. Mary. Thank you, Lynn. And Lynn Brown, Alberta authors, Michael Denicia, uh, Lynn Toscano, thank you. Th th thank you not only for this book, but for all the gatherings that you held in, the, in Florence, in the United States, on Zoom, that really crystallized and sharpened the essays that are in the book. And, and, and the result is a remarkably rich collection of, of writings that really should be on the shelf of anyone who cares about the arts and who really wants to dive deeply into why the arts are absolutely necessary. So thank you for, for that. Tonight, I have the great privilege of being in conversation with three luminaries. Oscar Eustace, Deb Willis, Anthony Appiah. Uh, and I know I've been told, you know, everybody has their bios, so I don't have to repeat that, but I am going to say a few words about each. But before that, I do that, I want to share an experience from when I was uh, the dean at the Tisch School of the Arts. Um, I came to, to NYU in 1991. And when I got there, um, the students of color were really grumbling. They were grumbling that there was no space for them. There wasn't a place for them there. Not in dance, not in uh, film, in theater. And um, it seemed to me that this was not my problem only as the dean, that it was a problem for the entire community. So we decided to do something called a day of community every year where we paused and invited faculty, students, staff to talk about what they did specifically to open up spaces for everybody. So in 2001, we chose the date of September 14th as our scheduled day of community. And of course, as fate would have it, September 11th took place and it disrupted everything. We decided we were gonna go ahead with our day of community. And, 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 and I can remember as if it were yesterday, we're all feeling disoriented. There, there was still soot and smoke in the, in the air. And we held the day of community in the law school auditorium. And people started filing in, and it was almost as if they were about to attend a wake. And, and finally, the auditorium filled up. And before we had a chance to start formally, a musician stood up, a black musician stood up with his trumpet, walked up on the stage without saying a word, put the trumpet to his lips and played Nobody's, nobody's Knows the Trouble I've Seen. He played it exquisitely, at the end put his trumpet down, and there was complete silence in the audience. And it was if he had said a prayer and we were all in church. And E.L. Doctorow, the late E.L. Doctorow, was our, was our um, scheduled uh, keynote speaker, followed him up on the stage and gave an impassioned speech about the role of the arts in a democracy. I thought that was a wonderful image of Zelensky performing in the best sense of the word. Um, his values as a democratic leader. And then for the rest of the day, the conversation was exactly the content of this book. Are the arts essential? And if so, why? And how do they work in the middle of a crisis like September 11th? And as I thought about this book and thought about this panel, I thought about that day. Um, and I, I, I want to, as I'm introducing the, the panelists, I will tell you, I want to pose a question to each of you. 
Given that we have faced our own set of crises, COVID, the racial reckoning, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, what would each of you tell your students today or young people today about why they should be making art? So I'm going to start. So I think about that. And I'm going to start with the introductions. Oscar Eustis, who's sitting right to my left, is someone I've known, I, I just said, I realized for almost two decades now, because you've been at the public theater for, what, 18 years, something like that? Uh, and you're also a faculty member at the Tisch School of the Art, and you have literally changed New York with the, the, the way you have supported artists, new voices, new ways of, of thinking about uh, performance and, and theater, and it, we're so lucky to have you in the public theater in New York. Deb Willis, I have known for over 40 years, I'm giving away our age, girl, you know, and in that time, I have watched Deb literally transform the field of photography. She has emerged as the foremost scholar of African American photography, and, and I, we'd be here all evening if I, if I uh, read off the names of her, her award-winning books on, on photography. And she's an outstanding photographer in her own right and has garnered all kinds of awards, including that MacArthur Genius Award. I always say Deb is certified. <laughs> she, she's a real genius, right? Um, Anthony, I haven't known you as long as Deb or as Oscar, but I will tell you, I'm a huge fan of The Ethicist, and I read it faithfully <laughs> every you. Sunday in the New York Times. But also, I find myself often going to one of your many scholarly books on ethics, culture, identity, uh, because you speak so honestly uh, about those issues. And you've been a, you're now a professor of law and philosophy at NYU, having been a faculty member at Yale, Duke, Cornell, Harvard, uh, University of Ghana. And uh, again, NYU is very, very lucky to have all three of you as uh, faculty here. So who wants to go first to answer that question? <laughs> well, I can jump in on this. Um, why is it important to make art in this time? Uh, I can talk about this in terms of theater, which is the only field I really know. Because theater is an act of people collectively, and when I say collectively, it's not just the people who make the shows, the people who are in the audience watching it, collectively telling a story to themselves that helps make sense of the world. And it's something I always think about when we talk about our current divide in this country. We all know, and it's said repeatedly, that we're somehow operating off alternative sets of facts, that people have one set of facts and another set of facts, and because there isn't a shared sense of facts, we somehow don't seem to talk to each other. But I would push that a little bit further and say, we don't have a shared story. We don't have a story that most Americans will say, this is the story of America. We have a huge conflict over what the story of America is. And for storytellers, that feels to me almost our main job is to try to tell stories that scoop people in, give a place for people to stand and say, this is where I belong in this bigger story. And I can belong here, and somebody else can belong here too. And if you can tell those kind of stories, then it's possible to have a dialogue. And to me, that's even more basic than facts. So the issue that I talk about with my students all the time is that we need to make sure, as theater makers, we're not replicating the divisions of the rest of the country, that we're not simply making theater for and with the people who are in our silo on our side of the aisle. But we're trying to find out how do you tell a story? Because, and, and the last thing, oh, I'm sorry, I'll be quiet, but uh, is that people's resistance goes down when they're listening to a story. When they are being lectured to in any way, their resistances go up. But if you can catch them up in a story, when Dick Cheney came to see Hamilton, Dick and Lynn, and they walked out and they said they loved it. I had an existential crisis. Uh, was I making a show that Dick Cheney could love? And my, my friend, Mr. Kushner, also an NYU grad, um, 
did as he so often did, is told me, no, Oscar, once again, you've misunderstood the role of the theater. <laughs> the role of the theater is to make people feel things that are beyond their conscious ideologies. So the way people change is you let them feel empathy and connection to people that they didn't feel that they had, that they didn't think they had empathy and connection to. And once that feeling exists, it's astonishing how pliable ideology can be. Well, you and, and in your essay, you you mentioned not not only the shared story, but uh, you know the dramatization of conflict, of of opposing stories coming into conflict with each other. Right, and that the basic idea of drama is that no single person can present the truth, or it's a very bad play. <laughs> you can't have a play where somebody knows the truth and spends the rest of the play convincing everybody else, and then we're done. Nobody buys tickets to this. It implies that the truth is only to be found in the conflict of opposing points of view. That that's because nobody's right at the beginning of the play. There's got to be somehow in the course of the play, the conflict between opposing points of view reveals a new truth. And so in that way, it's a model of what we hope democracy allows us to do. We, we need you on the floor of the Senate. Deb or, or Anthony? <laughs> no, I really think that's really important to follow because stories. You know, we think of a story. When I think about talking about this experience with, with students, I'm thinking about the women, and I'm thinking about family. Uh, I talk about the images that, that touch my heart um, based on the fact that the dads are saying goodbye, the fathers, um, the grandfathers are also taking care of the village, the villages, but the fact is that they're all of the, the different generation, intergenerational stories that they're all sharing on the news, but also how photographers and video cameramen are all looking at these stories of the women, mm -hmm. the loss of stories, the loss of the possibility of another generation because of the maternity hospital. So when I, I, I want my students to experience how to talk about the possibilities of a future, the possibilities of what art could do to change um, you know, this, this horrific experience. But the fact that the other part in, the, in America, there are the families who are hoping to adopt the Ukrainian children that are waiting and waiting for the experience. So this, there are so many levels, the multiple stories that I'm experiencing when I experience, when I look at the news, but I'm also looking at the notion of hope when they move, the, the, the migration of, of women and children moving to the countries from Poland to the US to other places. But, you know, the dancer, who decided that hope was necessary for her. And so what I'm hoping my students, um, and I mean the pun in terms of the double entendre with, with hope, is that how do we visualize the stories, the stories that hope will prevail through the possibilities of keeping the dialogue going as you talk about the dialogue on, as, as performance in theater, the visual experience will last um, forever, and it's something that I really want my students to continue thinking about. So, so, so following up on that, that notion of teaching hope and possibility, Anthony, you spoke in your essay about um, the imagination and the role of the imagination. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I should say thank you very much to all of you who organized this for giving us a chance for this conversation with these wonderful interlocutors. Um, uh, the, the, the brilliance of human creativity in the arts is that the arts do uncountably many things. And when you say to the arts community, art can't do this, you know that tomorrow some artist will. Uh, that's, the, that's the great, so, so you can't, uh, as it were, say in advance what all the possibilities are. That's precisely because uh, in exercising our imaginations, we're always moving beyond what we've already done. And, and as I say, the, great, the, the greatest provocation you could give to an artist is to say you can't do that. Um, but 
um, in, in these, uh, but, but at the center, I think, of, of the arts, which are, after all, incredibly diverse, when you think of all the things we call arts. But at the center of them, in all of them, there's this thing that is, is an exercise of the imagination. It's, it's, um, uh, it's uh, thinking about things that aren't so. And using things that aren't so out there in the world outside the art uh, to help us practice feeling, hoping, thinking, doing all the things that the human mind uh, needs to be doing. And, by the way, importantly, uh, taking pleasure, being in, in, enjoying it. Um, as, as Matthew Huddle said, it's, it's sweetness as well as light that you get uh, from, from great art. So, um, in a way, I think, I mean, you, you asked the question, uh, what to say to young people about why we should go on with this business. Um, I mean, first of all, as I say, the world would be empty of so many pleasures <laughs> if we abandoned all the arts. Uh, but also, our capacity for thought and feeling would be squished down. Um, I learned to think about love by being loved by my family, obviously. Uh, but also by reading about love and by watching Romeo and Juliet, uh, uh, both uh, on the stage and uh, in Zeffirelli, um, and reading it. Uh, and um, just think of the sort of emptiness of human life without the arts. Uh, there's a great story about a, a physicist who was being pushed by a senator to to defend um, his research, and the senator kept saying, but just, just reassure me that this will be useful for the, the, the defense of the United States. And the, and the physicist gave the right reply. He said, the kind of physics I do isn't going to give you any weapons. It's not about defending the United States. It's about making the United States more worth defending. The, the role, and that's because science is about imagination and creativity too. It's about deepening our relation to the world that we live in, knowing it better, but both because we can do things with it, but also just for the sake of understanding. So um, all the practical things that everybody keeps selling us that we should be doing, the things that make money and so on, uh, would be empty and pointless if there weren't things to be doing in the lives that the money makes possible. And the arts is a source of things that we value. It creates kinds of value that aren't there without the arts. You can't, um, I mean, once you get into poetry, right, there's a kind of pleasure you can have in a poem that is, it's, it's, it's sui generis. It's its own kind of pleasure. And imagining, for me, I was, I'm, I was raised by a poet, imagining me, my life without poetry, it, it, it sort of flattens everything, that thought, the thought of, without, without the, without the theatre, without photography, without film, uh, without music, uh, we'd have lives, mm -hmm. but they'd be barely worth living. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's, uh, and this is an argument not just for making art, of course, but for experiencing art, for living in the world of the arts, and, and not everybody has to be an artist, but I think nobody's life um, is nobody's life is as good as it can be <laughs> if they aren't experiencing the arts in some form or other. G given that the arts have this uh, incredible intrinsic value, right? Um, one of the themes running through the book, through many of the essays in the book, is that uh, if that is that is true, not if that is true, that is true, and. How do we, what, is, what becomes then the institutional responsibility to make sure that that value gets shared equitably? Mm -hmm. and, and Oscar, you um, took that on as a real charge for uh, the public theater, but I think it's a question we would ask for, you know, higher education, for universities, colleges, any, any uh, institutions that see themselves as places that are home to the arts? Well, there's no question that um, this idea that the culture belongs to everybody 
is a root idea of the public theater since it was founded in 1954. And the, the, the beautiful and terrible thing about such a mission is you can never successfully fulfill it. There's always more. You can always bring more people in. You can always include more. So part of that, as you say, is about audiences, about making sure that we reach audiences in prisons, that we reach audiences with our mobile unit, to people who've never thought of going to the theater, and let them know that there is something for them in the theater. So those that kind of audience expansion is, is terribly important. But in recent years, I've become even more interested in maker expansion, because what I've started to feel, Anthony, as you know, is that um, actually being artistic is not something some people have and some people don't. It's a fundamental condition of being human, that every human being has artistic impulses, desires, and abilities. Some of us get to spend 80 hours a week practicing them for our whole lives, and some of them get to do it in tiny spurts, but it's there in everybody. And once, you know, the, in, in, in my field, that creates a certain amount of confusion because we in the nonprofit theater have spent so many decades trying to define ourselves as professional nonprofit artists to distinguish. And suddenly like that, that distinction feels to me kind of missing the point. And the point is that can we actually figure out a way not to make professional theater part of people's lives, but to make theater in its broadest sense more available for people to make, see, use. And that's how I think you can start to unleash the real promise of the art form, is when it's not a clique, when it's not a priesthood, but rather it's something that anybody can touch. And uh, we've had some great proof of concept of that. Yeah. Well, actually the origin of the Delacour Theater, right, was to make, you know, make it all free. I mean, it, 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 it feels different now. And so you felt the need not to just have it in the park. Why, 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 why did you feel you had to go beyond that? This is, this is a perfect example of, of how history changes. Free Shakespeare in the Park in the 1950s and then the Delacourt was built in 1962 was revolutionary. And it did a huge amount to change the audience for Shakespeare here and then it was imitated elsewhere. But by the time I got to New York, Free Shakespeare in the Park which was created for maximum access, was the most difficult ticket to get in New York City. <laughs> and basically, when we had very popular shows, you had to sleep out overnight in the park to get a ticket to Shakespeare. Needless to say, that reduced the demographic of who actually came to the audience. So we had to say, victims are on success. Now, how, what do we add on to that to become accessible in other ways? And we founded the mobile unit, and then we found the public works, and there's other programs, which I won't go into. But, but the example that seems important to me is, yes, you won that war, or you made that advance, and all that does is create more problems that you have to advance more on. And, and that's great, that's a wonderful thing. It means you're never done. You're always trying to face the situation that you actually are facing, and figure out how, to, how do you bring more people inside. So Deb and Anthony, what, what, what do you think is the responsibility of a university like NYU? You know, I'm thinking about, um, I just had a, a kind of difficult conversation about editing, and I wrote an essay, and the copy editor disagreed with my experience about protest songs. Mm. And, um, and, I, and I thought about it as why, when you talked about space and the idea of the park. And one of the pieces that I wrote, um, I wrote about was sitting um, by the dock of the bay, Otis Redding. And I, that was a protest song for me um, in 1968. And, and I remember it well. Um, the editors said, no, I read 10 books on protest songs and it's not in the book. You know? <laughs> so I said, but just imagine, um, and goes back to the imagination, of a man who left his home in Georgia, and he's sitting in the San Francisco Bay. He's resting. It's a protest from labor. And so when we think about how do we consider our work, when we think about Shakespeare in the Park, when we, I stay out all night, 
<laughs> waiting for a ticket, but that was rest. And the idea of how do we talk about what's going on today and the aspect of you know, grief and rest, that we rarely think about our activities. It's always about the, the rush of it, the experience of making it happen, but rest is never a part of the sense of joy. <laughs> There's something that we need. And that's something that happens in the classroom. I am exhausted, you know, and it's midterm. And how do we find, how do we get through the next seven weeks? Um, because we're working constantly. So when I think about, when I thought about the editor that I spent, too many hours on, still talking about her. <laughs> but, um, and I was, and I tried to get the photographer to see my sense, but he, he believed the editor, you know. But I've been fighting editors all my life as a black woman. Um, I remember writing, um, picturing us, in picturing us, I wrote about our rites of passage of, of young girls, and we couldn't wait to get our hair straightened. And the editor wrote, that's not a rite of passage. That's something you had to endure. So when I, when I said to him, I wrote, do you know what it meant for us to be, to desire Philadelphia, to have our debutante, oh, he says a black deb? That is impossible. I can't even imagine a black debutante. So here it is, as someone who's gonna be responsible for publishing my work, who couldn't even imagine the breadth of a black experience. Mm -hmm. And so when I, in the classroom of this institution, constantly thinking about how do we broaden the conversation for our students to understand what it means to be an artist, but also what it means to imagine, you know, and how do we reimagine what we don't know, you know, that's the possibilities, you know. Like when I think about um, a Baraka, he wrote, possibility moves us. And, and I think that that's something that I find important when both you and Baraka talk about the imaginary in such powerful ways and it guides me to help <laughs> our students, you know, rethink some of the projects they're working on. So, so you're, you, you, you see that as, as fundamental and foundational to what you're doing here at um, NYU is kind of breaking through those limits that people have placed on what they're able to see and hear. And they don't think. even realize yeah. they're, they're I mean, the, the limitations. They don't, they don't even realize it. They believe, <laughs> right. You know, that's, yeah, that's what I... Honestly, believe I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> I do think that. I mean, you asked about the sort of the responsibility of the university. I mean, um, one of the privileges of living in our time is that as uh, university education has grown, we live in a world in which um, more and more people have access to the tools for interpreting more and more mm -hmm. kinds of art. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, without widespread university education, uh, Ulysses, not uh, James Joyce's Ulysses, wouldn't have the audience mm -hmm. that it has because you need preparation and help uh, right. to, to read that book. Um, you need preparation and help to attend to certain kinds of music. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 12-tone music doesn't speak to you immediately in the sort of way that the sort of things you want to do. Is this a long term? This is short. Oh, thank you. Sure. Hello? Sorry. Um, yeah, so, well, I don't know. I'm giving you a useless <laughs> <laughs> microphone. Um, so, um, so one of our tasks, I think, is to uh, prepare people to participate as creators and audiences, uh, uh, more people to have access to things that are less accessible, um, kinds of uh, kinds of pleasure 
that are require preparation in a mm -hmm. way that uh, some some form some 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 arts require less preparation mm -hmm. at least for a person sort of raised in a normal way in society. Um, but also, I think um, to, to remind people through um, through appeals to the arts. I mean, I never. I don't teach philosophy without talking about novels and poems and mm -hmm. movies and uh, sometimes music, but, but mostly novels and poems and movies and theatre because, uh, because the way those uh, uh, practices um, develop your imagination mm -hmm. is something that you can then take on into your moral life. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And making sure that people know that that's, I don't, I don't ever forget the joy and the pleasure, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's the mm -hmm. joy and the pleasure as well uh, of, of reading a, a poem or a novel mm -hmm. or listening to a piece of music or watching a piece of theatre, but, um, but to say that it's more than that, that's great, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with pleasure, <laughs> but, but there's more than that and that you can't live the best kind of human life um, without exposing yourself to some of this. Now, again, one of the great challenges and but also joys of our age is that um, there's infinitely too much of it for you to experience all the stuff worth mm -hmm. experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can see because of video recording, um, I could spend the rest of my life right. every that? day seeing <laughs> five good Mm -hmm. I could spend my days being bad ones as well, but uh, I could spend my days being every day, you know, five, uh, five two-hour periods of watching performances of one sort or another, and I and I would I wouldn't exhaust what's worth looking at. Um, I can't see all the paintings worth looking at. I can't look at all the photographs worth looking at. I certainly can't read all the novels worth reading. I once. I was once chairman of the Booker Prize Committee. I see, it felt like trying to read all the novels <laughs> worth reading, but I only read 175 that year. Oh. Uh, and, you know, there's, that's um, a tiny fraction of what was published mm. that year. Sure. So one of our tasks is to help people live with this incredible responsibility of curating your own mm. way through the infinite fields of what there is. I, there's, a, there's a great um, painting in, in the, one of the scholars in Venice, of, uh, of uh, St. Augustine dreaming of St. Jerome, and on the, behind him on the wall is his bookshelf. Mm. He has all the books that were worth reading. He's read them all, <laughs> right? We don't live in that world right. anymore. Right. And so one of the tasks of preparing people for a decent life is mm. preparing them to balance and to make choices right. uh, among all the right. uh, artistic uh, right. possibilities. And speaking of choices, uh, in one of the discussions that we had uh, leading up to the publication of the book, I remember you were, you were saying, and, and, and uh, Alberta reminded us today also, she said, art has uh, heroes and villains. And, and you made the point of uh, D.W. Griffith's film, yes. uh, Birth of a Nation, yes. to remind us that, you know, not all art is good and honest and true. Yeah. And, and um, also, great art can... can serve terrible purposes. I mean, uh, um, Adolf Speer's architecture, is his name Adolf? No, Adolf mm -hmm. Hitler. Uh, Albert, Albert Speer. Speer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great architecture, mm -hmm. but it was done for the Nazi state. Mm -hmm. um, Leni Riefenstahl's great movie mm -hmm. about the right. Berlin Olympics, it's a great work of art, but mm -hmm. it's and it, it's a little bit subversive, I suppose, a tiny bit of the of the Nazi purposes, but it's basically a kind of mm -hmm. celebration of Aryan mm -hmm. heroism. So that's another thing we have to teach people, mm -hmm. to be careful and cautious right. and to not to be led astray, as right. it were. Because something can be a powerful work of art and be aimed in the wrong direction. Right. And so, and, so, and so I want to talk a little bit about language, because you're, you're right, you're, we're, we're, we're also wanting people to understand how to read a work of art or hear a work of art in a dis discriminatory way. Um, Deb, I was really fascinated by your looking at the photograph by Gordon Parks, um, that, or the series of photographs that were done on poverty or, or a family that was living in poverty. And you focused on the photograph of a starched plaid dress mm -hmm. hanging 
on a wire hanger. And you use that uh, to evoke these ambitions and aspirations of that family. Talk a little bit about what, you know, why you were so attracted to that particular photograph. Yeah, it's Gordon Parks has a photograph in the Fontanelles um, project that he focused on the Fontanelles of Harlem family in 1967 when he um, decided or was assigned to photograph poverty in America. I was fascinated with the story that Gordon visited the family for a week before um, he carried his camera and decided to photograph them. But I always think about, and, I, and this goes back to the mothers in, in Ukraine today, of, of mothers, and, and we, we just talked about fashion earlier, how dress as armor uh, was impo is important to everyone. Um, it's not, it's across the board. But for Gordon to see a house that is in, it's really a, a terrible situation where they lived, but the mother was preparing her daughter for, for school and a starched dressed, um, plaid dressed, iron, and it said, it had a sense of pride and wanted to instill that sense of pride in the little girl, Ellen, five years old, going to school. That the family, then Gordon also picked up on the fact that the, the students, um, the boys and, the, and the, the brothers had books, stacks of books that he photographed, watching them read the books, um, bare lamps, um, barely could see, but the house had you know, poor heating, everything about it was uncomfortable for them. But the mother and the Gordon would um, photograph this dress that's hanging on the side of a bed that had stacks of clothes, dirty clothes, clean clothes, but Gordon could see that he, his mother, Bessie, was preparing her daughter for school. And in and, and doing that, and doing so, so that the teacher in Harlem would recognize this little black girl who had a difficult life, but the mother believed that her daughter was dressed for war, for battle. That's right. You know, she was dressed because she knew that the teacher probably wouldn't believe that she's going to do her homework. Mm -hmm. And that's why those students, that's why that dress was so important for me to so just reimagine the life of this little girl walking into a classroom and the sense of pride that she mm -hmm. would um, feel as she presented herself, as she prepared for the, an eight-hour day in the classroom. It, it, it makes me think of this whole no, notion of imagination and future and possibility that, you know, was so embodied in that image mm -hmm. that he ca that Parks uh, captured. It's, I, I, I love that. I, I want to raise a topic that um, uh, we're, we're all thinking about since we've been you know, locked into Zoom rooms, and that's technology, right? And so technology kind of haunts us, whether, whether we like technology or don't like it. How, how do you think technology now inserts itself on the whole conversation about the arts? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I think you should ask Oscar to talk about Zoom plays. <laughs> <laughs> Although that would mean I'd have to think about Zoom plays. I'm so happy to not be thinking about the, 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 uh, uh, Technology has improved. It will continue to improve. There will be new technologies. But I think the question is always, who is using them for what purpose? What are you trying to do with the technologies? And, you know, Anthony, I couldn't help but think, when you were talking about the birth of film, and you were talking about birth of a nation, mm -hmm. and there's a direct line between that most famous masterpiece of early American cinema and Gone with the Wind 20 years later that became yeah. the most popular movie yeah. in America. Yeah. And they were both, they may have been great works of art or not, they were both in the service of lying. Mm -hmm. They were both in the service of telling a false story That's about right. history, and they were, it's, it's one of the things I think we have to take seriously what we do as storytellers because those two movies, mm -hmm. along with many, many other things, were key to having a false narrative about the Civil War and the period after the Civil War right. take over the country. The South may have lost the war, but they won the narrative. Mm -hmm. And that is what delayed us so horribly 
in, f before the civil rights movement, in what, in what still is dividing us. There's a story that, or with the Olympiad, you know, on the one hand, you can say it's a great piece of work. On the other hand, she made a film about the 1936 Olympics without Jesse Owens in it. <laughs> now, that's a lie. That's an omission of the star of the 1936 Olympics for ideological purposes. And I, I, I'm a little far astray from technology, that except for to oh, say- Oh, no, you're not, because it Birth of the Nation introduced all kinds of new technology into cinema, and Gone with the Wind was one of the first Technicolor yeah. uh, uh, films, which I, I thought was interesting, as you were saying that, to, to think about that. And, and we can see what has happened to social media, where 20 years ago, there was some credibility to the idea that social media was gonna be a positive uniting force in the country. And the reason it's not is it was monetized. It was monetized and the, the best way to sell ad revenue turned out to be create algorithms that made people look at inflammatory material because they tended to click on those more often. And there's a direct lead in. So it's not the internet, it's not the technology that's caused it, it's the fact that the technology was turned into a money-making machine. And that became, the it overrid everything else, and of course it's had disastrous social consequences. But you brought, Mary, you also brought up the fact of, of reading the images, mm -hmm. and, and how do we take time to read images through this new technology. You know, 75th anniversary a few years ago for Gone with the Wind, and I had, and I taught that class that year, and keep a talk about the the film, and because you know I you know grew, grew up looking at Gone with Wind, and all as many of us had the experience, but looking at it again and rereading it, um, I saw things that I I never had noticed before, mm -hmm. that the the quilts that the women were making, interesting, the <laughs> the um, the black musicians who who played um, at the dance um, the that there were black musicians during the Civil War who played classical music, mm -hmm. and that whoever the d designer or whoever did the background on some of the pieces decided to make a difference, but it was overlooked mm -hmm. by uh, mm -hmm. little things mm -hmm. that Hattie McDaniels wore red lipstick. Um, we missed that. Mm -hmm. That she also wore gold earrings. Um, during this time. And so thinking about her grandfather was a Civil War soldier who never received his pension. Mm -hmm. She spent 25 years trying to get his pension. But the fact that she wanted to, that role because she felt that it was really important as a, a descendant of a Civil War soldier mm -hmm. that she could tell that story. Mm -hmm. And she also, <laughs> in terms of being the most feminine woman in mm -hmm. the film, because she mm -hmm. taught... Scarlett O'Hara, how to be a woman mm -hmm. and how to keep a man. Mm -hmm. But she was also flirty with, you know, Clark Gable with the whole aspect of it. So the whole aspect of how they used her body as this undesirable body because it was a full-bodied woman. But I started thinking about here is a way to reread this story. You know, like we know they run the narrative. And so I gave a talk at the University of Texas, Austin, and... The, a number of the curators said, well, you know, there, there are people who are going to not kind of agree with some of the things you're going to talk about, so just be prepared. And they're called Wendy's. They're called, sorry? Wendy's, like Trekkies. Oh, okay. So they're Wendy's, and I never knew that there were Wendy's that attended events mm -hmm. about the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And a Wendy walked up to me, and she was very upset, and she said, you know, you didn't have to do all that. You know, and I said, what? And she said, well, you know, she wasn't really a great writer. Mm. Um, and I said, yeah, we know that. She says, but you didn't need to tell us all of the work that we hid. Mm -hmm. we, we don't want to know about that story about the black women in their nights talking together. They were, there was a darkened night. Well, we probably will never see it, but anyway. But they were talking about the war, about the soldiers coming and preparing for the fight. But they didn't want to know that. And so she was in my nose, nose to nose, till a curator walked up to me and said, I really want to apologize to you because we have this often because Wendy's want to keep 
the narrative. We won the war, we're gonna keep it that way, you know, and that, that story. So I think it's really important to talk about reading the image closely. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just an amazing experience to have to spend a lifetime rereading images and creating another narrative um, mm -hmm. that's there. Mm -hmm. You know, this, you know, the same experience that we've all struggled with. How do we keep telling, how do we tell a, a new narrative that's an old narrative? That, that, the, the complexity that you, you say that, you know, that Hattie McDaniel introduced what was actually recognized during her day. I mean, she was, a cel she was celebrated by the black community as, you know, uh, one of their heroes in, in cinema, even though, you know, today it, we, we see Gone with the Wind and, and we might cringe, right? But, but the, the, to understand how to read, I think, yeah, that's, that's an important part of when we're talking about um, making sure that the arts are equitable and accessible that we don't often don't talk about. You brought up about the new technology and I'm noticing that some of the artists working today or most artists working today, male artists, are making quilts. Hmm. So we're going <laughs> back to a time where we know that women were quilt mm -hmm. makers, but a number of male artists are making quilts. Mm. And so I think that this exchange of what's happening with art today, that a number of men who are looking at family members who were quilt makers. And mm -hmm. so I think that that's mm -hmm. another level mm -hmm. of how technology is kind of boring, I guess, for a number of young, <laughs> younger artists who were reconsidering their practice. Are, are there ways that we've seen, though, that um, technology has emerged and been a revelation and have captured something of the imagination and possibility in the, in the future. I mean, you know, when photography was invented, it was just an incredibly disruptive uh, technology. It was gonna ruin painting. And, and, and they believed it, <laughs> but, I, but it didn't. <laughs> but I, I really, um, but just considering the work of, I'm, don't want to name too many names, but just kind of thinking about what the artists are, in terms of what they're trying to tell stories with um, short stories through um, three-dimensional images. And the, what's the, I'm trying to think of the new term now, but. Um, Augmented reality, virtual reality. Vir yeah, mm -hmm. VR, right. <laughs> and yeah, that's it. And the fact is that we had to experience exhibitions through online exhibitions over the past two years, gave us an opportunity to enter a space of virtual reality mm -hmm. that we never thought we would have an opportunity to experience. I think it was, it was fascinating for us to begin to reimagine our lives walking into a gallery mm -hmm. through our computers, but it, it gave us a chance to pause, to look closely at artwork, and spend the time. So that's the the aspect that I'm experiencing, even though I don't know <laughs> much about VR, but I had the ex experience of working with Ellen Toscano on a show on women and migrations and, and women, uh, 100 women, and we had an opportunity to look at a range of women working in different media, but having the experience to show the world the work through this internet exhibition online, and a number of people had a chance to see it and mm -hmm. experience it. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. I think it is worth remembering that uh, that uh, art, the arts uh, always use the the available technologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, printmaking yeah. develops because somebody invented presses. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, the life of the book was radically changed by the invention mm -hmm. of the printing press as a technology. Um, uh, uh, the development of the, the piano forte out of the mm -hmm. earlier uh, keyboard instruments reshaped uh, classical Western music. And then that instrument was taken mm -hmm. up to produce mm -hmm. jazz and, mm -hmm. uh, and blues and so on. Um, so. And again, I think it's this point about that kind of imagination that you, the artists take what's there, mm -hmm. they use what's there, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. uh, the theater is being changed, obviously, by um, just by this this technology right. that allows right. uh, allows us to hear things that uh, couldn't be projected uh, without it. Uh, lighting technology has improved. Uh, camera technology in movies has made possible different kinds of filming. Um, lighter cameras, mm -hmm. new lenses. I mean, all the time, it seems to me, artists are um, both going back to old technologies, like sewing and, <laughs> and quilting, but drawing on the, the interest of new technology. So all the virtual art stuff that's going on mm -hmm. now Mm -hmm. uh, the, the sort of computer art, even the creation of little TikTok videos, mm -hmm. which is a very democratic uh, um, technology. Uh, you don't need much um, to, to make those little videos. You just need uh, the equivalent of, um, of an iPhone or uh, a phone like that. I think all of these technologies are being taken up and, and people are, um, you know, people become successful, new, new kinds of people develop, mm -hmm. new kinds of people are successful with these technologies because the new technology enables different kinds of imagination, different kinds of creativity. And we mm -hmm. should, that's not going to stop. You know, whatever our technology we develop, people are going to be doing things with them. There are people doing things with, um, with technologies that were created to do science, mm -hmm. but they're using them to create, to, to create art forms. And, um, a couple of years ago on, in a Nature article, I saw a uh, a nanotechnology work of art that had been created mm -hmm. by someone. Now, the nanotechnology wasn't made mm -hmm. in order to make, right. uh, you know, uh, minuscule works of art. But as soon as as soon as right. it's there, some artist is going to think of a way right. is going to think of a way to use it. Yeah, I, 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 you, you make me think, Anthony, of Red Burns. Some of us remember Red Burns, who kind of invented ITP over at the Tisch School. She said, "All that technology is just gadgets." It's really your ideas and the imagination what you bring to it. She said, we all have pencils, but we all can't write the great American novel. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think Red was right. Um, thank you so much, Anthony, Deb, Oscar. I, I know we've run over time, um, but uh, I, I think this has been, we could sit here and probably talk another hour, but... Uh, your essays, each of your essays are brilliant and provocative, and as are all of the essays in the book. And I would encourage everybody who's here and who's listening to go out and immediately buy several copies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.